Hello and welcome to Cloud Computing Basics. This is Tom O'Connor of the Gulf Coast Legal Technology Center and Craig Baer of Opiable and we are going to go over computer basics for working in the cloud. So really what we're talking about here is how do we go from a traditional network and this is what we all had five years ago. You had a server and then you had a whole bunch of desktop computers connected to it to a cloud computing network where your data is in this mythological cloud and it connects to it somehow. And we're going to kind of go over um, how that happened and how we can work in that environment. Okay. The other thing that we need to kind of really discuss is, is how we can um, work at, with a private cloud, a public cloud, a hybrid cloud. So again, you might have some programs at your office, but you also have programs in the cloud. You might have some programs at your office that you can access through the cloud, but you own the hardware and you own the data. So it's all kind of like merging together. Let me ask the question as we're, we're looking at some examples of software in the cloud here though. What exactly do we mean when we say the cloud? That's a um, nice marketing term and I'm sure people have heard it many times. What exactly does that refer to? Yeah, I mean, and I don't think there is like an official Webster's Dictionary definition. To me, it means the ability to access your data anywhere at any time through any device. That would be my definition of the cloud. And, and again, as we jump back to these, some of these slides, that could be private cloud where I have data at my office. I own the hardware. I you know, have maintenance done on that hardware and stuff like that, but I could, I could be in Bangladesh, and if I had internet access, I could get to that data. So for lack of a better term, uh, and I know this is an oversimplification, but for folks who are just starting off in the technology area, when we say the cloud, we're really talking about some sort of internet access. Absolutely. All right, great. Let's just <laughs> make sure that people are understanding what we're talking about when we get geeky yeah, on them here. The, the cloud is in the internet these days. That's right. So what are some of the examples here? So, so these, these examples would be you own the hardware, okay, but you can access it anywhere. So um, Citrix is a, is a program that people use all the time where they have a server with Citrix on it and they use something like a Zen app to open up Microsoft Word on their iPad, but it's really being used at their office. Um, tabs 3 is another good example where you own Tabs 3. It's an accounting software. You install it at your office, but it has a, a cloud-based application on your phone or on your, your desktop at your house where you can access all that data and use it. Um, Amicus Attorney does this, um, PC Law, Time Matters, uh, Rackspace is another company. Um, Amazon Web Services is branching into this as well, but again, you own the actual hardware, so it's yours. So let me backtrack. Amazon was a horrible example there because you don't own any of the hardware. For the private cloud stuff, you own the hardware you bought with a credit card like a Dell server and put it in your office, and then you installed software on it. Um, so you you kind of have the, the nice feature that it's yours. You know your data is not commingled with all these other people, but you have to maintain that data. Right. Uh, and then just going into, because we're going to jump into some of the public cloud options, in the private cloud, you own the software usually outright. So you own the software outright, so you don't have to worry about like paying like a monthly fee or anything like that, which brings us into the public cloud. And, and I would imagine that the other benefit of a private cloud is that it is in fact private. You restrict who has access to it. Absolutely. You don't have to worry about, you know, like let's just use... Dropbox as the, the whipping boy here, but like, you know, some Chinese hackers attack Dropbox. Well, that's somewhat likely because it's so popular, you know, or they had do a denial, what they call a denial of service attack against a popular web-based company. That's not going to happen on the private cloud because it's, it's your stuff in, in your data centers. I mean, it's less likely to happen. Yeah, so it's all your data. And in addition to hackers who are deliberately looking to do things, you're not going to have inadvertent access. People will type in the wrong... Earl someplace when they're doing a search and somehow be able to get into your data. That's, Absolutely. That's not going to happen. Absolutely. Okay. As opposed to, now we're looking at public cloud examples. Right. And so these are all products that most of them you pay monthly. You own no hardware at all. So you go to a website, you sign up, and then you upload your data somehow to these programs. 
um, and you can use them anywhere. And, and we're throwing out examples like Net Documents, which is a document management system. So all your documents will be put in there. That's kind of the same thing as SkyDrive, Dropbox, and Google Drive. Um, Office 365 and Google Apps are email, calendar, and programs. And then we've got some practice management or CRM case management software like Clio, Rocket Matter, My Case, things like that. But again, you don't own any hardware, so you don't have to pay an IT guy, but you are paying a monthly fee. Okay. Um, what about browsers now? There's so many different browsers out there. Are all these examples going to work under every browser? Well, they should if they're good. I mean, if you're, if you're basically, if you're hiring a really good, you're paying a, a monthly fee to a good cloud-based company, it should work in any browser. At least that's my opinion. They should be what they call browser agnostic. So it works in anything. Because if you have a, an Apple computer, you don't have Internet Explorer. And there is no way to install it. I mean, you can install parallels, but that's something completely different. So you can't do that. So they need to work in any browser. Now, I will say that some work better than others. Like Net Documents works better than Internet Explorer. It has some added features, and that's okay. And that's pretty common. So you might use a product in one browser, and if you, the browser of choice has some more features, we can live with that. But for it not to work in like Firefox or Chrome at all would be kind of unacceptable. So when you hear the phrase, this product is optimized for Chrome, that doesn't mean it won't work in other browsers. Right. It means that it has been built with maximum features in that particular Absolutely. browser. Okay. And, right. and again, I mean, I, I kind of do feel for some of these guys because there are so many different browsers and you got to make so many different changes for all of them to work. Yeah. Um, you know, the one thing I would say from my personal experience is that Google Chrome, which is available on a Mac, and it's also available on an iPhone. Um, you have an Android device, so do you have Chrome as your? Yes. Okay. That, I find, is the best. It's the fastest. The fastest for viewing any sort of crowd-based software. The other thing that I've seen, which is kind of interesting, is you still do get tech support calls when someone has a, you know, a cloud-based software. They're like, Craig, I can't do this. I can't get to this menu. And I'm like, well, hey, just try opening that up in Chrome and doing the same thing and tell me if that happens. And usually it doesn't. What, you know, the cool thing for, for the user is, is that you got three browsers on your computer, so you can just switch to another one right. and, kind of, and kind of fix the issue yourself. Right. So what issues do we have to discuss here? Um, ethics is definitely a, a big one. So there's all sorts of ethical implications from putting your data into the cloud. Um, the ability to access it. Um, kind of some security issues, best practices, we're going to go through all those. Okay, so let's take a look at the ethical issues. This is a list of opinions by bar associations in various states with regards to cloud computing. Uh, they vary uh, from somewhat specific to <laughs> very vague, but I think you can see from the highlight here that the words reasonable or reasonable care are repeated quite often. That the underlying essence is that the attorney takes reasonable care to protect his or, his or her client's privileged information. Uh, is that a fair assessment of what you're saying so far? I think, I mean, to me, they're all the same. Okay. And if you look at them, again, I'll put it here, I'm not an attorney, so, but they look to be the same, and it's the reasonable care, that's why. I, I highlighted in this picture reasonable care is, is what's out there. I mean, more states are coming out with opinions, but, but, but that is reasonable care, although I don't know if that's always defined in those opinions themselves. No, I, I would say more often than not it isn't defined. Uh, and uh, I also would caution that more states have not issued an opinion on this than states that have, so it's a certainly a developing issue and attorneys in whatever state they practice in should be very, very uh, aware of that and keep an eye on their bar association for any standards that might come out. I think the other caution to have in this is that it is very common these days to practice across state lines. You might be doing with business with someone uh, who is uh, either located in a state other than yours or has business locations in multiple states you may be then conversing with them across state lines and you may have co-counsel in another state uh, who you're discussing issues with. So you have to be careful 
about where the documents are located and are you up to speed on the varying opinions in the different states that you're in. It's a, it, it, it's a, because it's a developing field, because the standards are still emerging, just something that we have to be very, very cautious of. So I, so I guess we can tell, you know, people, you need to check that. But I think there's some, besides, I mean, everyone always goes to the ethics opinion, but there's also kind of other things as well as protective orders in specific cases. Uh, well, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, simply because there are no specific standards in a specific jurisdiction, that does not mean that a judge in a, in a case cannot, in fact, order what he or she thinks is reasonable, uh, especially given the, the facts in that case. I was involved uh, on behalf of some of the plaintiffs in the BP litigation when we were very early on setting up the databases. There had been a request made uh, by some of the parties to the court to uh, implement the use of Dropbox to move documents around because there were, of course, a, a huge number of documents. And the judge, Judge Barbier in that case, was not particularly comfortable with that because he saw it as a more of a public option that was not controlled directly by the parties. So he ordered uh, the plaintiffs to set up their own private cloud uh, if they wanted to proceed along those lines. So you're absolutely right. Judges can issue often very specific protective orders in a case. Uh, the other consideration, of course, is compliance with a variety of different standards that may be out there, uh, ranging from security like ISO uh, to one we see an awful lot if you're involved in cases that have medical records, which is HIPAA requirements uh, regarding uh, how medical records are to be stored and or handled. Uh, as you've highlighted here, Dropbox does not currently have uh, several of those standards, uh, and including HIPAA compliance. Uh, Google, as I understand it from our discussions, has HIPAA compliance now, but it was only implemented uh, late last fall, the fall of 2013. Yeah, October correct? 2013. Yeah. So um, before that, it wasn't HIPAA compliant. And I'll just tell you that the scuttlebutt is that they're very weak on their compliance. Okay, so obviously again, if you're gonna take reasonable care uh, or reasonable precautions uh, to ensure that your data is secure and meets all ethical standards, you clearly wanna look into whatever medium you're using, uh, whether they meet all of these different standards. I would also caution that once again, local rules, uh, many local state insurance agencies have their own uh, rules about how insurance documents can be handled. Uh, you should certainly, of course, uh, be aware of what the rules are in the, in the various states for that and, and any other agencies, uh, whether they're state medical records uh, and, and, and uh, uh, certainly down here along the Gulf Coast, maritime records. There may be, depending upon your case type, some very specific requirements for how things can be handled. I know, for example, in uh, California, uh, it, 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 they have very strict rules about driver's license records if you get across them and, and displaying that number. Uh, the state of Oregon has very strict rules concerning in the state code concerning the displaying of social security numbers in addition to whatever federal restrictions there are. Be aware of what the restrictions are in the jurisdiction where you're working. So this is really a checklist and, and kind of at the end of the slide in the notes we do have um, an actual one page PDF that we've created, but there are really five different things that we're gonna look at. The last, the fifth one is gonna be broken down into three categories, but I, I really look at this checklist as if you're looking to get a cloud provider, um, they're not all created equal. Um, there's a lot of wackos out there that got a server running in their garage that are a cloud provider. And so these are kind of like the list that I would go through. This is the list that I go through. Um, because our company uses a lot of cloud-based technology and we've got you know sensitive data. So we go through this checklist um, and I think that if, if you use something like this, this is pretty reasonable. Okay. You know, this is like reasonable steps. So let's go through this. Um, all right, so again, you've kind of, you're, you don't have hardware anymore, so then you've thrown this out to another company. They have to have redundant locations. Um, you know, you don't want to use a provider that has one location like in, Manhattan and then a Hurricane Sandy comes which happens and it throws it down I, I put this picture on the bottom right because I was using a cloud-based provider I guess I had not gone through my whole checklist yet 
Um, and they only had one data center, and it was in New York City. And they had to caravan gas up for like 36 hours to keep the generators running, to keep everything running. So um, again, you want, and we're, we'll talk about where those locations are, because that's important as well. But you want someone that has two locations, at least, okay? Two, two actual separate physical locations, not in the same city, so that if one of them fails, they can turn the other one on. And especially if there's a natural a hurricane, earthquake, or something like that. Now, the map that you've got portrayed here has locations throughout the world. Um, it, it, again, you have to look at local rules regarding Absolutely. where storage can be right, had. Right. Some federal agencies, for, for example, are are not going to be happy if your redundant location is in Kuala Lumpur. No one is going to be happy about that. Right. I mean, again, your locations, um, you really got to stay continent specific, and then it just depends on what continent you're on. And the reverse is also true if you're doing business with companies who are working in foreign countries. Uh, the EU countries are an excellent example. They have very stringent restrictions on how data can be moved, and in several cases, cannot leave their jurisdiction at all. Can't leave their borders. That's right. And and in and several of the countries over there, Italy and Germany in particular, uh, violations of, of that rule are criminal uh, violations, and, and they enforce them very strictly. So uh, redundant locations, but ask where they are. Right. So this one, SAS 70 Type 2 certification, say that five times really fast. Um, this is actually an accounting company, uh, comes into your, to the cloud-based provider and they do an audit. Now they do this audit regularly and they have to go through their own checklist. Um, I think this is kind of the gold standard I've seen for cloud-based computing. So if, if someone has a SAS 70 Type 2 certification, they've done the right things, they got a little money behind them, they set everything up the right way and I would feel fairly confident they're gonna be around for a while. They just didn't throw like a server up there. I mean, we could throw a server, again, in a closet and say it's a cloud-based company and charge people for it. Right. This is a yes or no question, right? Yeah. You either have SAS 70 certification or you don't. Right. Okay, great. Data escrow, I was just asked about this in, in, in a, a matter with a client this week. Right, so I'm using a, a cloud-based company called Clio as the example here because they really do have, um, I think, one of the best data escrow policies. There's really two parts to this that can be really broken down. Um, so data escrow in one instance is like insurance. So you have this data escrow insurance and if your company goes out of business, that company, that escrow company takes over and provides the data to whoever was out there. So if you, if you, you know, look, all these cloud companies are new. We're not dealing with a 30 year old company here. We're dealing with, you know, five year old companies. Um, two-year-old companies and look at the rate of failure on companies that young. So the whole idea behind data escrow is again, if you're, that company goes out of business, they have an escrow policy in place to provide that data in the same method for a certain amount of years. You can just ask about that. The second thing, and I think this is just really cool, I guess it's like a geek in me, but um, like Clio has ability to configure their service with Amazon Web Services. And so you can completely back up all of your Clio data to Amazon Web Services like every night. Okay, so there's two factors of that. There's one is that that's just good because you have the data somewhere else. But the other one is, and, and this Clio is not a good example for this, but let's just say you're using a, a cloud provider and you decide, hey, they suck. All right, you know, I'll put in any other better words than that. I don't like using them. They raise their rates. I want to get, I want to move to something else. Can you get your data out of there? So that's why I kind of put these together. Like Clio, they will help you get your data out of anywhere to do anything you want with it. And they've got like this set up here. So it's kind of, do you have a data es data escrow policy? And how do I export all my data out? And you're exporting that out in what's called a CSV usually. So comma separate variable. And then you can import it into something else. Right. Um, you're going to have to get something else. It's not like you're going to go through these Excel files right. and, and operate. Okay. Privacy seals, I, I suppose, from the name, as it implies, have, have to do with uh, security and making sure that not anybody can access your information. Yeah, and this is this is pretty basic here. Trustee, DigCert, there's a couple of them. Symantec's got one. Um, you just want to see these on the website. Okay, I don't know any other basic way to say it, but what sort of privacy seals do you have? You have two, what are they? Okay, those are 
pretty good. And I, we have a list here in the notes of, of the ones that we found out. But you need to see some sort of privacy seal there. Okay. So th th this is kind of the fifth the fifth thing is where does your client's data reside? You know, where, uh, how secure is that data? Who can see it? So we've got like three questions on client's data. Okay, which we've kind of addressed We before. touched on this on the redundant locations, but it's an important question, even for the primary location. Where is it? Uh, I was actually involved with a case earlier this year uh, where uh, there was a problem with uh, a company and uh, the law firm went to get the data that they thought was on a server in one location. And in fact, it turned out that the, ser the data was actually on a server in another location outside the jurisdiction of the United States. It was uh, in a British Commonwealth location in a, in a warm part of the world that the uh, individual had not revealed. So yes, very, very important to know where your data is actually physically residing. And ask. Yeah, I, mean, just, I think know, this is an ask point blank. Where's my data going to be? And if and if they're vague on that, I think you got your answer right there. Right. I mean, the companies that I deal with, and it's, it's funny because I run into it because I actually do some work in the EU, and um, I have to have like separate logins to go into that to those cloud-based systems because they're different data centers. That's right. Um, and, you know, but they tell you that right up front. And so that's really, I mean, if, again, if, if you're in Europe, you know, your data cannot reside in the U.S. and really vice versa. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of everything else. But this is a straightforward answer. This should be, oh, well, here's our PowerPoint and here's like a map to data center one and data center two. Right. It should never be vague. Okay. This is a very, very important one. Uh, it was one that caused Google some heartburn for several years uh, when they were trying to sell their products to large law firms and their terms of service uh, actually had wording that they were asserting an ownership right over the data, which of course for attorneys and client documents is a clear breach uh, of the privilege uh, and uh, nicks the deals. I don't mean to, to, to point just at Google as you've got on the slide here. Um, other companies have dealt with this exact same problem, but it's very important when you're, again, doing business with someone or starting to do business with someone to ask this question. Um, it's a pain to read through these terms of service sometimes because they're 20 pages of legal gobbledygook, but they're very important. And if you're a lawyer, you should be able to do that. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the thing that you also have to be care about is they change their terms of service. Oh, yes. So, I mean, pressure from clients or potential clients made them aware that it was an issue. But um, again, as you said, there's a lot of these companies out there and you have to make sure. I, I like the one in the middle where Microsoft says, we don't claim ownership of the content you provide in the service. Boom, and yeah. just, you know, very plain, very straightforward. Yeah. Yep. So the third question to ask about this, and this is one that's gotten a number of companies into trouble because they assert that your data is secure and nobody can look at it. And then it'll turn out that in fact, some high level supervisory people have access to everything in all the data banks. Again, this is a real straightforward question to ask. Is my data hidden from view from everyone inside the company? Um, this is a particularly important for attorneys if you're talking about information that's being stored during litigation uh, because showing information that you're claiming is privileged to people who are not covered by the attorney-client privilege, as most attorneys know, can lead to a waiver of the privilege, not just for that data, but perhaps for all the data in a case. So it's extremely important that you are taking, this is clearly one of those reasonable steps. Are you ensuring that nobody else who is not covered by the privilege is not looking at your data? If there is a question, I always advise to get some sort of a uh, an NDA or an agreement of some sort with the company that says for purposes of this litigation data, you are considered to be covered by the attorney client privilege. You're working as an agent of the company of the law firm under the supervision of the law firm and attorney client and work product privilege applies. Right. Um, again, this is a real clear ask the question. And Microsoft, like Microsoft 365 will do this for you. That's right. N no a question good, A good company will say, sure, we understand the issue for you and we'll be happy to do that. Right. Yes. So here's the other solution. Now, first off, I mean, I'm gonna, this is kind of maybe somewhat of an answer, but you should be asking that question anyway. 
because if they don't, they can do a lot of screwy things. But really, your own solution, especially if you're using a Dropbox, uh, OneDrive, Google Drive, is you can encrypt your own data. Um, and, and we're talking about using separate programs added on to these like Vivio, Sucasa, and Boxcryptor that actually encrypt the data. So you install this program on your computer, you install this program on another computer, and then you put everything into Dropbox. Well, if you go to the Dropbox website, it looks like this. It's just all like, you can't read anything like that. But if you go to the other computer, because the encryption key is on there and it's decrypting everything, you can see it. Right. Um, you know, I've used Boxcryptor. It's there's sometimes can be a little lag, but there's not a lot. But um, really, you know, I'm gonna jump on the Dropbox is not secure bandwagon now, because really there's been a, too many incidences where you know, and this is like a couple of weeks ago, where you know, if you take a Dropbox link and you copy it into uh, a browser bar and like Google Chrome, all that information gets recorded into like Google's AdWords, and like always people can find it. And there was a group of people that found you know, 1099s, mortgage documents, W-2s, and all that stuff like that. So if you're gonna put your client's data in any of these services, it has to be encrypted. And if it's not encrypted, it should never be shared out with anyone. The other thing I'd say is I've got a client that has two Dropbox accounts, and he was like, look, I just use Dropbox to back everything up, because I'm like worried about that. But that account has like a, it's like a, you know, 20 like letter, character, password, and he goes, really, all my data just sits on there on the server. Now, if anyone asks me to share anything, I'd use a separate Dropbox account, you ah. know, f for that. So I'm I'm not share I'm not throwing everything out there. Right. Um. But you really, yeah. I think. Look, I'll like. We haven't heard of anyone getting in trouble yet. Yet is the key operative there, like, because someone's gonna get in trouble. Someone's data is gonna get linked out, and then we can use you for the example in the, in the sl in these slides. Right. But it's gonna happen. It's happening. Yeah. It's happening right now. Okay. The other possibility or, or other item you recommend is also use a password manager. This really, to me, goes without saying now. Don't, right. don't use the same password uh, for everything you do, and, and you can use a uh, password design or a password. Uh... Yeah, so what I use is a product called RoboForm. Um, RoboForm um, sits in my browser bar. So, like when I go to a website, um, I have to type in a password once to unlock all my passwords, and then RoboForm will populate the password. So I use, pa like, I don't know what any of my passwords are. They're all okay. in Robo RoboForm. I just have one master password. The other thing is character-wise, I use 12 characters. So, and they're a mix of symbols, numbers, letters, right. uppercase, and lowercase. Right. Um, your password to get into your practice management software in the cloud cannot be password, Okay. You know, because I'll tell you what, I know what your username is, it's your email address. You know, your yep. username is your email address and all these things. So all we have to guess is the password. It can't be your kid's birthday or anything like that. Right. You have to be using some sort of password manager. Okay. And then finally, smartphone and tablet security. We've been talking about computers here, but we have to be really aware of using all of these uh, security devices when you're working on smartphones or tablets because you're working in open areas, places like coffee shops, airport lobbies, hotels. Uh, they're easily intercepted. If they're not secure, they're also easily stolen. These devices can be picked up and, and walked away with very easily. So you have to think about security on these devices as well. Uh, I mean, you have to have the password in there. You can't just open up your phone. You have to have either, you know, the iPhone has the thumbprint, which works. Um, you have a code, you have to have something. Yep. Because if you're using these cloud-based software, like, yeah, like you said, like it's easy to get to that data and you gotta be able to remote wipe it. Right. So what about access? So this is gonna basically, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking about going to cloud-based software, it's gonna change some of the way that you work. Um, this is not scare tactics here because my experience with cloud-based software is better than having that hardware actually in my office. Right. So, but there are outages. The thing is, when like when your office goes down, you know about it, and maybe like ten other people know about it. When one of these cloud-based services goes down, like everyone knows about it. Um, I mean, what I'd say is that the outages usually aren't bad, but there's a couple of things that you can do to minimize this. If you're going to cloud-based software, which 
that's the way everything is trending to. Um, it's really time to ditch the desktops, move the laptops. So if your office loses power uh, or loses internet, you know, and you still have power, you, you can't work because everything's in the cloud. Well, you need to be able to pick up, go home, go to Starbucks, go somewhere else, and be able to reconnect to that data. I mean, you have to be able to do that. The other thing that we're going to jump onto on the next one is, let's see here, is have a, a wireless router, a MiFi, which is what I have. So you can use this. They cost like $40 a month. You can connect like five to ten devices to it, and you get internet through it. So if the internet goes out of your office, you can have two or three of these, and you turn them on, and then everyone can connect to those and keep on working. Right. Um, but you have to have strategies like that. The other one is, is if, if you're using Microsoft 365, have a Gmail address, you know, so that if anything happens to 365, then you can go on there. You have and, a backup email right. to use. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Any other tips? No, I mean, it's go to laptop so you can move around. Get a MiFi. You're saving money anyway. Go get a MiFi, um, and just you know plan for that. I mean, I've seen the only thing other thing I'd add to this. And this is somewhat expensive, but people will have two internet connections with two separate service providers in their right. office in case one of them goes down. They can switch over to the other one. Right. Um, depending on the size of your firm, that may or may not be overkill. Okay. And finally, communications in the cloud. What are we talking about here? So. Um, this one, VoIP, was, which is Voice Over the Internet Protocol phones, so VoIP phones, this is what I use. So instead of plugging this phone into a phone jack, you're plugging this phone into like the, the big Ethernet jack that you have at your office. Right. So your phone is going through the internet now, and it's not going through the phone line. Um, this is the phone that I have. Um, I'm using a service called 8x8. Um, this phone, for this one line, cost me $35 a month. Unlimited phone calls, um, unlimited long distance, U.S. and Canada, all included in there. The price is exactly the same every single time. I could take this phone, bring it with me anywhere, and as long as I could plug it into the Internet, it would work. And if someone called me, it would always ring to this phone, which is nice. I also have an app on my phone. If I turn the app on and someone calls me, it will ring directly to the phone. Right. Uh, the, the one Katrina story that I'll just throw in here is the big problem with Katrina is no one could forward their phones after the storm. Um, you could for you could log in. I had a problem actually at my office the other day with my phone. And so I just went into the system, forwarded all the phones to my cell phone and everything worked. Um, these are going to be cheaper than traditional phones and better. Right. So a VoIP phone that, yeah, that's your communication in the cloud. Right. Um, Ruby receptionist is a service also available uh, over the internet where they're picking up your phone when it rings, and it's an actual human being who's right. doing this. Um, we mentioned Ruby Receptionist because it's one that both of, both of us have used. There are other services. We're not specifically endorsing this or uh, saying this is the only one. Uh, take a look around and see what's available. I know there are at least there is at least one other company offering this service in New Orleans, uh, but Ruby's been around for a while. They're, they're, they have a national profile. Uh, they exhibited at the most recent ABA tech show, right. uh, so they're a well-established company. Uh, a real human being will answer the phone, uh, say, this is Tom O'Connor's office. If you ask for me, they'll actually try to ping me on my cell phone or whatever I've told them is okay to see if I'm available. If not, they'll take a message, and, and you get it. So it's a, 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 a much cheaper alternative to having to pay the salary and benefits for a live person 40 hours a day in your own um uh, in your own office. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something else that got moved to the cloud. My receptionist is in the cloud. Right. I mean, it really is. And uh, same same model and same pricing as cloud-based software. Right. And email, of course, we touched on this earlier. We've mentioned Office 365 several times. Google people are aware of for Gmail, which is one of the earliest ones, right. to do uh, cloud-based email. But uh, Office 365 is a is a is a uh, a newer but great contender um, basically looks like you're if you're using Outlook now in some sort of an exchange server setting this will look exactly the same from the end users point of view there's no difference uh, the back end is different of course instead of being on a server at your office the email boxes if you will are sitting uh, on Microsoft server someplace that also means that you can synchronize 
So if I'm getting the email on my phone or my tablet or my desktop, uh, wherever I may be, uh, it doesn't sit there. I can access it equally from all of my uh, all of my devices. Also, if I enter a calendar appointment on my cell phone, it'll show up on all the other devices because they're looking at the central box on the Microsoft servers. Incredibly cheap, right? Right. It's Five dollars an email address a month. That's and I want to be specific here. When we're talking about Google, we're not talking about Gmail. If you're a lawyer, you can't use that. It's bad. Use Google Apps. That's five dollars a month. Microsoft 365 for just email is five dollars a month. They've got some other really nice plans that give you the full office suite on multiple computers for twelve, to twelve, fifteen, yeah. fifteen dollars a month. Yeah. As, as, as well. I mean, the industry, I think, is going to Google Apps or 365 users. And I think with the advent of the uh, Word for the iPad and for, you know, the Chrome devices and the Android devices, you're going to see 365 adoption. I think it's going to pay. In the legal, you know, professional services industry, it'll start passing over Google I Apps. I totally agree. And this is just, again, we kind of talked about this before, but on the whole compliance thing, this is something that if, if I were an attorney and I were using Google Apps and I had medical records, I would really look into it um, because really if there's some sort of breach, there's no time commitment. The, the whole HIPAA compliance for Google is much weaker than Microsoft. And that's the only thing I'd say that. And you're the attorney. You could make that decision if this is something for you or not. Right. Just so, legal specific software. We've talked about generalities here, with the exception of, of email and communications. But what about some of the software we use? Becoming available on the cloud? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that really, if we look at this right here, practice management wise, um, practice master, Amigas Attorney, and Time Matters were like the big three practice management softwares that you would install. You know, for 20 years they have been, and you install these at your servers at your office and use them. They all have basically that private cloud option now. So if you have Amicus at your office, if you have Time Matters or Practice Master, you can now basically access them anywhere as long as you're on their support or maintenance plans. So you still own the hardware, um, but you can get them anywhere. So like the whole thing is access anywhere from any device, that totally exists. Um, the public cloud, um, really I think the, the big ones you're gonna run into are my case, Clio, Firm Manager, there's a couple other ones out there too. Um, but those are the ones that we run into all the time that people are actually using f for their practice management and CRM. Okay. Um, so you've got those options. Document management, so this is interesting, but World Docs, Hummingbird, and iManage, and iManage has changed its name like every year and I just don't keep up with it anymore. Um, these are the products, again, that you would install actually in your office for your document management software. And now we have a lot of options for public. Um, we've got Dropbox, we've got OneDrive for Business, we've got Google Drive, um, but we also have something called Net Documents. And again, I think that if, if you really are storing client data in the cloud, Net Documents is the way to go because it's made to store this data and it hits every single one of those compliance things that we talked about. It's HIPAA, it's every compliant thing that you need. Um, I would Dropbox. Look, I use Dropbox. I have this presentation in Dropbox because I need to share this presentation with people. I don't care if anyone steals this presentation. Right. Okay. I've got a couple of personal things encrypted in there. I have no client data in Dropbox at all, yeah. nor would I put any in there. Um, that's not the norm. I know all the attorneys that have it and all these legal softwares integrate with it. But really, you want to look at something like Net Documents or maybe World Docs to actually store that, that data. And uh, this issue, especially with all that data getting leaked from Dropbox, is going to be more and more prevalent to actually look at that. But these are, these are your public, you don't own any hardware, and you pay just a monthly service fee. Okay. Word processing? How, how, how are we in the legal environment as far as working, not storing your documents, but working in your documents? Well, you know, like I said, I never took a side in the debate between word or word perfect because I kind of felt like it was like picking a religion. Um, but you know, honestly now, Word is available in the cloud. And what I mean by that is you can log into Google Chrome and launch Word and have almost all the same functionality and it works very well. Um, you can't do that in WordPerfect, okay? And so that, honestly, I, I hate to say, might be the death knell of WordPerfect. Besides the fact that no one, you know, under the age of 30 knows how to use it, um, it's the fact that, you know, 
WordPerfect just doesn't have these options because it's not owned by a company like Google or Microsoft. You have Google Docs out there. Google Docs is okay. And I know, I, you know, you always run into one or two people that are like, yeah, that's what I use, and I can save to Word and save on to it. But, I mean, I think, you know, Microsoft Word is the king here. Right. It just makes it the easiest, the easiest thing to use. Yeah. And, again, with the 365, it's cheap. What about integrations? How are these things all fitting together? Well, well so th the question that we're inevitably going to get, like through email or people calling and asking us, is what do I use? Well, uh, you know, there's no one answer there. So we kind of just went over a variety of different things. Um, so what do you use now? I mean, you need to take a pen and paper and write a list. Okay, this is what I use for email. This is what I use for my documents. This is what sort of scanner I have. Go down the list and list everything you have. And then you find a cloud-based product that integrates with that. Um, for example, Clio integrates with Google Apps, but does not integrate with Microsoft 365. Um, Time Matters integrates with Microsoft 365, but does not integrate with Google Apps. I mean, so there's all those those components there that when I visit with a client, I'm like, what do you use? And, you know, okay, so this won't integrate, so you're going to have to replace it, or if you don't want to replace it, we've got to look at another option. Right. Um, but th they're all building massive integrations. All these products are, if, the, if they're not there yet, they'll probably be there sometime, but when you're picking a product, you got to figure out what's out there. Okay. So, conclusions. We've talked about what the cloud is, some of the variations on private cloud, hybrid clouds, public clouds. We've talked about how to select your cloud provider and the questions to ask. And we've talked about some of the checklists to use when you're actually going to go ahead and implement, as well as some of the issues to look at and potential problems. Um, the overall conclusion seems to be, however, that especially with, with Microsoft, the cloud is the future of their, not just email, but their applications, Word, right. uh, Excel, PowerPoint. All of those have become cloud enabled. Uh, you told me a stat earlier today that uh, in the last two months, Office for the iPad. 26 million downloads. Right, in two months. In two it months. only came out two months ago. Right. So clearly, uh, you need to look long and hard at this, and not just because the technology uh, is conducive to the way we work, but the pricing is extremely uh, aggressive uh, and, and favorable to uh, attorneys of all size firms. And finally, the last thing I think, the one that really was a, a big consideration for me, is that I don't have to worry about it. They're going to provide the upgrades. They're going to provide the maintenance. I don't have to worry about getting a disk in the mail and what version of Word do I have, okay? If I'm using Office 365, Microsoft is taking care of all of that for me. That's worth 12 bucks a month to me. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what I'd say is, I mean, I say, you know, you make that term, everything's moving to the cloud. Um, I honestly see that we're going to live in like a, uh, like a hybrid environment. You're going to have... 75% of your services in the cloud and maybe 25%. But that 25% now is super manageable because it's a lot less stuff that you have to do. So you're going to have two or three programs and you might have that in a data center that's replicated. So it's still, you have the cloud access, but you're going to have a mix between public and private cloud. And, right. and that's the way the data is going to be going forward. Um, yeah, and so the checklist there that we have is a kind of like a great example to go through and kind of see, to see that. Here's our contact information. Uh, we'll also buy this. We'll have a PDF of all our notes, too. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks very much, Craig. We appreciate the time. Thank you.